So we, we're spending a couple classes these days learning basic facts and vocabulary about finance. And uh, along the way, we're trying to apply the simple lessons that Irving Fisher taught about uh, turning a financial problem into a general equilibrium problem and making use, in particular, of the budget set. You know, that very simple budget set we wrote down at the very beginning turns out to be quite useful, and people often can get quite confused. So the last issue we ended with, I'm going to take up again. Suppose that you've got a very long-lived institution like Yale, um, how should Yale think of how much to spend every year? What is Yale's budget set? Well, you know, almost every big institution like Yale creates a fiction of an annual budget. And, you know, they talk about the deficit and having to bring the deficit under control and making cuts to, you know, close the deficit gap. But really, there is no such thing as a, as a one year budget set. I mean, why one year? Why not one month? Why not one day? Nobody expects Yale to budget, balance its budget every day. Some expenditure comes in in the day. They have to hire an electrician to fix something unexpected. They're going to spend more money than they take in, in uh, student uh, tuition that day. So the fact that they're supposed to budget the balance every year is just a fiction. Irving Fisher taught us that Yale really has, if you can borrow and lend and you don't have to worry about risk, there's one infinite lived budget set. It's an infinite horizon budget set where you just take the present value of all the expenditures, that's the, that's the left hand side, and the present value of all the revenue, that's the right hand side, and make sure that the left hand side is smaller than the right hand side over the whole course of Yale's life. So that simple principle has a tremendous implication, which was overlooked to the chagrin of the last Yale president. So as I said, the issue was in 1997, I believe, it could have been 96, something like that, 1997, uh, Benno Schmidt, who was then the Yale president, released a white paper, he called it, documenting the fact that Yale hadn't, uh, had deferred maintenance in the buildings, he called it, and the, a study that he commissioned, a very good study that he commissioned, argued that the deferred maintenance Yale could be brought up to snuff and then go on afterwards as a normal running institution, provided it spent $100 million a year for 10 years. And that included fixing every college. You know, they're going to do more than one a year over a 10-year period. So but Yale's total budget, as I told you, was about a billion dollars at the time. And then here, all of a sudden, was this $100 million a year expense for 10 years. That's 10% of the Yale budget. And a lot of the costs, you know, you can't change. I mean, you have to have the lights on, you have to heat the buildings. You can't really reduce those costs. So Benno Schmidt came to the conclusion that he'd have to reduce the costs he could change by 15% in order to balance the budget, to cut, you know, about $100 million a year out of the budget. So he announced one day that he was going to fire 15% of the faculty by attrition. You know, if they were junior faculty, he wouldn't promote them. And if they were senior faculty, he'd wait till they retired and not replace them. So this, needless to say, caused a tremendous commotion among the faculty. And as I told you, a committee was formed, and, and I had to present the report. So actually, the report went pretty carefully through all the calculations made in the white paper. But the heart of the report was simply to, real, to apply the lesson of Irving Fisher. So what is the lesson of Irving Fisher? Let's suppose that there's no inflation, so that when they say $100 million a year, they mean $100 million real dollars a year. So Irving Fisher would say, Yale's going to live forever. Let's suppose that, we want, that Yale wants the same quality of education every year forever, so it should have the same real spending every year forever after, after it uh, compensates for inflation. So at the moment, we're assuming there's no inflation. So what does that mean? That means that you just look at the right-hand side and you say, what's Yale's revenue? Well, whatever it was before, we've, we were told by this report of the president that as long as you def did the deferred maintenance, Yale would be back in balance. So what's the loss of revenue on the right-hand side? It's 10 years of $100 million a year, as you can see. Now, you need a, a, an interest rate. What should the interest rate be? Well. Uh, should it be the nominal interest rate or the real interest rate? Well, we're supposing now there's no inflation, so it should be the real interest rate, because all the hundreds are, are, you know, have no inflation in them. So what real interest rate shall we use? Well, the, the white paper 
used 5% because they thought that was the number that Yale could, could uh, earn after inflation pretty reliably every year. They, call, they think that's the, the, the real rate of return Yale gets, and so they discounted at 5%. Now, the real rate of interest typically in the economy is 3%, but let's suppose that we calculated this at 5%, the present value of uh, 100 for 10 years is 772. Now, how could you do that in your head? Well, <coughs> we know that you know, 5% is going to double every, 5% um, is going to double every uh, 14 years. You know, 5 into 72 is about 14. So in 10 years, you're going to get if it doubles every 14 years, 10 years is going to be less than half the value of the bond. So if you got 100 forever at 5% interest, that would be 2 billion. And we know for only 10 years, it's less than half the value. So, you know, considerably less than half the value. So it's not 1 billion, it's something less than that. It's 772. So I just did that in Excel and I calculated 772. But in your head, you know that if it had gone on for 14 years, then the present value, our formula, our famous formula is that you would take the coupon 100 divided by the interest rate 0.05 times 1 minus 1 plus r to the 10th. And so we know that if, if this were 14 instead of 10, you'd get a half here. So this is 20 times 100, which is 2 billion, times a half would be 1 billion. But since it's only 10 years and not 14 years, it's less than a billion. So, OK, 772. So in your head, you could have probably figured that out. So the loss in present, you know, approximately. So you could be sitting there in the audience hearing Ben O'Schmidt talk and be computing in your head that we're talking about something under a billion, like you know, three quarters of a billion. So now, how much does that mean reduction in every year? Well, if Yale's going to spend the same amount every year, that means it should be spending 5% of 772 less every year. That's $38.6 million less every year. So that's a drastically smaller number than $100 million a year. It's crazy just to think that because you've got these expenditures for 10 years and the no expenditures after that, that you should you know, cut the budget by $100 million and then let it go up after 10 years. So um, you'd only need to cut it by $38 million. Now, by the way, 5% is a pretty arbitrary number. Suppose you put 3% here. Well, 3% would give you a much higher present value but then when you multiply it by 3% at the end for the, for the annual reduction, it would give you a much smaller number. So that, anyway, this number, uh, which I computed in Excel, but again, you can do it sort of in your head, is 853 million. But you multiply that by 3% and you get 25 or 26 million a year. So now the reduction is starting to sound like it's not such a, a frightening thing. So let's so stick with the let's stick with the five percent, which is what the white paper. Take all the assumptions of the white paper and take it literally, and then notice that they never said anything about inflation. So actually, this uh, this calculation of present value loss is is a uh, it's right. It's it's um, there's inflation, and say the inflation at that time was around four percent. In fact, all the Yale contracts that are still in place assume a 4% inflation, even though inflation is less than that now. But anyway, so that 100 million a year of dollars is actually less in present value terms, because what should you discount by? If you look at the present value of 100 million dollars over 10 years and you take into account its dollars, you should be discounting by the real interest rate times the inflation. Okay, so by 9%, a little uh, over 9, tiny bit over 9%. So if you discount that by 9%, you get uh, 641 billion as the present value, a million as the present value loss to Yale. Okay, now, given that there's inflation, how much should you be spending every year? Okay, you should be spending in real dollars, reducing your expenditure. How much in real dollars? Well, by five, not by 9%, by 5% of the 641 million. So if you have 641, that's today's present value in, you know, it, there hasn't been any in inflation yet. So that's the real loss in dollars. So if you ask what's the real expenditure reduction every year, it's 5% of 641. And that's 32 million. OK, 
Okay, so 32 million is a far smaller number than 100 million and requires a small, far smaller drop in, exp in you know, expenses. So our committee recommended that we cut the faculty by 6% instead of by 15%. And you know, 6%, there are a lot of people leaving every year, you can do 6% pretty quickly. So the upshot of this is that it's a simple application of present value, very elementary calculation. It came as somewhat of a revelation to our administrators, I'm afraid. And uh, <laughs> the day after the report, the provost of the university resigned. Two weeks later, the dean of the university resigned. And two months later, the president of the university resigned. And Rick Levin, the current president, took over and he um, cut the faculty by 6%. But by no more than that. And then, of course, the, the finances of Yale got much better. And he's since added back that 6% plus a little bit more than that. So just to tell you, though, something good about the Yale administration, the provost who resigned that next day happens to be a friend of mine. I've had dinner with him every month for the last you know, 12 years since this happened. And he's never once um, criticized me or shown the slightest discomfort about the report that basically ended his, uh, his, you know, his administrative career. He cares so much about Yale and is so de was so determined to do the right thing, he just thought he made a miscalculation and stepped aside. So he, he so I believe that he wanted to do the right thing for Yale and just made the wrong calculation, not that he had some political agenda or something to cut such a huge part of the faculty. So it's the, the most honest and the most uh, um, Yale-loving uh, administrator that um, you could imagine. And um, I didn't know what the reaction would be of someone like him. After giving the report, I was quite terrified, actually, that they'd be, they were still the president, the provost, and the dean, that they would be quite angry at our committee. Um, but they responded. Um, with tremendous integrity. Yes? Okay, you tell me. Why did I do that? <laughs> so, why, so, did someone else tell me? So that's a good question. Why is that? Yes? It's like finding the coupon of a perpetuity um, but with a 5% interest rate. <coughs> Right, so the question was, why after I figured out the present value loss, like uh, 772 million, why did I multiply that by 5% to figure out how much Yale should reduce its spending every year? And the answer that was given down here is that I'm assuming that Yale is going to go on forever. So Yale can reduce its expenditures every year forever, and by doing that, make up for the same present value loss. So. Uh, forever means perpetually, so it's a perpetuity. So how much do you have to reduce, what is the coupon reduction, the expenditure reduction every year at 5% interest that just makes a present value decline of 772 million? Well, it's 5% of the principal. If you have 772 million in the bank and every year 5% of that you throw away, you've thrown away the whole value at 5% interest of the 772 million. So by reducing your expenditures by 5% every year, you, you uh, defray the $772 million loss. So that's the crit so the critical thing, the critical mistake that the administration made is they had a short run problem with a bunch of short run costs, but Yale's gonna live forever, and Yale should f should share the cost and the loss over all future uh, generations, not just make the current faculty and the current students and the current, you know, city bear all the costs of, of, uh, of this one-shot uh, loss, the, you know, one-shot problem that Yale faced. So they weren't thinking in Fisher's terms of taking the present value over the whole course of the lifetime of the institution. They were thinking, well, we've got to spend $100 million this year. We better cut costs by $100 million. But, you, but that's obviously crazy. Like, suppose you had to spend an extra you know, $100,000 in one day. Uh, does that mean you should you know, lay off your faculty for one day so you can find the money to, uh, to pay that? And of course not. So you have, to, you have to spread the loss over the lifetime of the university. Okay, so are there any other questions about this principle? Yes. If you wanted to return to 
say spending $100 million a year again after 10 years, if you spend $77 million a year, so that's just 10 years, if you wanted to incur the whole cost over a fixed period of time? If I wanted to incur the whole cost over, over 10 years, yeah. then I would have to reduce my expenditures by $100 million a year. If, I, if, if, if at the end of 10 years I wanted to be back even, then I would have to spend less. I would have to cut my expenditures by exactly the money I was pouring into the buildings. So if I wanted to you know, reduce my expenditures by an equal amount every year, it would have to be $100 million for 10 years. Right? If the horizons are, if, the, if the, the maintenance costs go over a 10-year period, and I want the expenditures to go over a 10-year period, right? Then, oh, if I, so if I want the expenditures to be reduced evenly over a 10-year period, I'd have to do $100 million a year. If I wanted to eat away the costs all in one year, I guess I didn't understand your question. You're saying if I wanted to reduce expenditures entirely in one year and then return next year to my usual pattern of expenditure, then I'd have to cut the $1 billion budget by $772 million. So that would you know, involve basically firing the whole faculty and saying, take a year off, you're on furlough. Sort of what they're doing in California. So, <laughs> yes. You also spread the, the present value cost evenly over 10 years, not like $100 million every year, but $100 million in present value terms. I could do that if I wanted. I could rearrange the $100 million anywhere I want, any way I wanted to. So you would cut less than $100 million this year out of the budget and a little bit more every year after that? Well, if, one way to do the costs over within a 10-year time frame is reduce costs, reduce, you know, paying the faculty by $100 million every year for 10 years, right? That would obviously do it, because that's the money I need to get. You could now rearrange that by reducing costs a little less at the beginning and a little more at the end of the 10 years, but I would say that doesn't sound, no one, you know, why do that? And that makes the, you know, that's kind of what bad politicians do. They say, well, we're not going to, you know, not our fault, we'll just make those guys in year 10 get totally crushed. And sooner, pretty soon, they are in year 10. And then they've got, you know, 200 million they have to cut costs. And that's, yes? So in, say in 25 years, Yale wants to do another round of rebuilding all of the buildings. They'll still be paying for the buildings that they built in 25 years prior? Right, okay, so there's a good question. So there, there, there so actually some people, you know, the administration, that was their best response. They said, well, even though the white paper said this was a one-shot thing, and after we do this 10-year plan, Yale is back in good shape. And of course, every year Yale has allowed, you know, maintenance expenses. That's part of the budget is maintenance. And so after we get the buildings back in ship, you know, tip-top shape, we're going to keep them in tip-top shape by doing these uh, you know, normal expenditures every year, so we should never have another period where we have to do something drastic like that. That's what the white paper said. But after our, the report, they responded just like you said. They said, well, we didn't really mean that. Maybe in 25 years, we're going to have to do another remodeling uh, effort. And so, well, if you needed to do that, then uh, it wasn't just you know, a one-time deferred maintenance, it means that you've drastically underestimated the cost of keeping up the buildings over, you know, over the Yale's whole future. And then you would have to, then it wouldn't be, so then you would have these reductions in expenditures for the first 10 years, and then, you know, in year 35, you'd have to have more reductions, and then in year 70, you'd have more reductions like that. So you'd have to take the present value of all those things and then figure out how much to reduce expenditures on an even basis. And so it would be much more than 32 million. It would you know, be 60 or something million or 50 million. So you're exactly right. But that's not what they said in the white paper. You know? So I took them literally what they meant. And um, so what happened after that? You know, Yale has done much more building expenditures than that, but that's because Yale's endowment went up to 23 billion. You know, so from 3 billion, which it was at the time, it's now 23 billion. So Yale's launched an incredible program of building construction. Basically, they've done two things. They've hired a huge number of, uh, built a huge number of construction jobs, and they've hired a, a lot of administrators and stuff. So, well, <laughs> The faculty's still not that much bigger. You know, it went down 6%. It's now back a little bigger than it was before. So you know, the plan to expand the college and expand the faculty hasn't happened yet. So 
Yale faces another choice now. You know, the endowment went to 23 billion, and then this past year they managed to lose down to 17 billion. You know, 30% got lost. So we're down to, to 17 billion now. So again, we have the same question. We just lost $6 billion. How much should we reduce uh, expenditures every year? So, what's your answer to that? Not 30 percent. What? Uh, yeah. So how much would you reduce expenditures? Well, why wouldn't it be 30 percent? Because Yale spends a lot of money. It doesn't get from the endowment, right? It gets money from tuition, for example. So, you, okay. So how much would you? Yeah. So what should Yale do? What do you think Yale's going to have to take out of the budget now? Yeah, and let's say it's still 5% real interest, then what would you do? Present value $6 billion. Yeah. And we assume there's 5% interest. Yeah. Then, uh, um, so what's that? And then 6, over 0.05. 6 times 0 0.05. So what's that? Hard to do these things in your head, right? But what is it? <laughs> okay, 300 million. So Yale's got to somehow cut 300 million out of its budget. And um, so it's not going to do it in one year, but over the course of the next few years, it's going to have to cut 300 million. Now, the budget is well over 2 billion, so that's 15% of the budget, though, Yale's going to have to cut. So this is a serious thing. How do you cut 15% of the Yale budget? What? Firing faculty. Well, I, I hope they don't do that. I think they learned their lesson, so I doubt if they'll do that. But there, it's, uh, you know. Things are already changing. They're charging for long distance telephone calls and you know, all kinds of stuff like that. <laughs> it doesn't get you quite 300 million, but there's going to be a bunch of stuff like that. So anyway, we have another budget problem. By the way, so these kinds of budget problems are happening all over the country. I gave a talk at Albany University, and they're going to, they're going to abolish their graduate economics program. Um, SUNY Albany, that's what, you know, so they're doing all, you know, these are serious problems losing that much money. But in any case, six billion translates to, right, the difference here is six billion, and you multiply that by 0.05, just as we said, and that equals 300 million a year. So Yale won't do it right away, but over the course of, you know, a few years, Yale's going to have to reduce its budget by 300 million. So they're going to obviously choose to do a lot less building, and some of all those, those presumably some of the new people that get hi got hired, they're going to not keep. So, okay, any other questions? Yep. Yes. Right. Okay, very good question. So, in the front, he's saying, you know, this presumes that we know for sure that the endowment lost six billion, it'll never recover it. Um, maybe that's a temporary drop in the stock market and it'll go back up. And basically the principle he's applying is he's saying you can't make these drastic reductions in annual expenditures, you know, firing people and then two years later realizing you've got a lot of money and trying to hire them back because you won't be able to hire them back. So clearly Yale has to have a more complicated rule about how it gradually adjusts its spending when there's a change in the endowment. And so we're going to talk about that later because it involves uncertainty and how to think about uncertainty. But you're absolutely right. The Yale, you, Yale will not. So Levin did not announce a $300 million reduction immediately, but he's announced a big reduction immediately. And you know, you can expect next year, if the stock market doesn't drastically improve, for there to be another reduction. And by the way, you know, this number could go down as well as it goes up. So we're going to come back to Yale's investments and you know, what they're like. A lot of Yale's investments are called private equity investments that are very hard to value. So for all we know, this 17 is a lot worse than that. Um, but we'll be finding out uh, in the next year or two. It's not like a hedge fund where you have to you know, value all your assets by what the market will be willing to pay. A lot of these assets, they're, there is no market, so they just sort of make up what the number is. So we have to, anyway, we're going to come back and discuss this. It's a very interesting question. Okay. All right. So one last thing about this present value calculations. One last obvious thing. It, it, it's hard to keep in your mind the difference between real and nominal. Okay. So let's just do a very simple thing. The mortgage, mortgages 
are traditionally nominal, pay, no, traditionally nominal fixed payments. So you might pay, okay, so for example, a $100,000, $100,000 30-year mortgage at 2.3% is about $4,600 per year. How did I do that so quickly in my head? Well, because I know if the interest rate is 2.3% and you're going to pay it forever, you'd pay $2,300 a year. We know at 30 years, at 2.3%, 2.3% doubles almost in 30 years. That's 69, that's getting pretty close to 72, so maybe it takes 31 years or something to double. So after 30 years, the remaining part of the mortgage is only you know, the remainder, the remainder is worth half the mortgage. So you've lost half of the value by only getting it for 30 years. So instead of paying 2,300, you have to pay 4,600, you know? So the coupon over 0 0.023 times 1 minus 1.023 to the 30th, okay, that's, that's 1 minus a half about. So it's, so if this coupon equals 100,000, the payment is going to be since this is a half, the payment isn't going to be, you know, 2,300, it has to be twice that, 4,600. Okay, so it's 4,600 per year. So if there's no inflation, that means you're making the same real payment every year. Now what happens if there's inflation? What if inflation goes up? What if inflation goes up? Okay, now what's going to happen to what you have to pay? Well, this is just... Okay, how would you figure that out? Well, if inflation is, you know, another 2.3% or something, then you would pay, then the, the nominal interest rate, 1 plus i, is going to equal the real interest rate times the nominal interest rate times the rate of inflation. Okay, so let's say this is 1.023 and this is also 1.023, so that's 1.04 a little bit more than 4.6, almost, you know, a little bit more than 4.6. So you know that the interest rate the mortgage companies are now going to charge is going to be uh, 1.046. So the 4.6 is going to be the, the, the mortgage interest rate, and so you can figure out by the same calculation what, what the coupon's going to be. So what's the coupon going to be? Well, if you're, you know, instead of doubling every 30 years at 4.6%, it's going to double approximately every 15 years. So this is going to be doubling twice. This is a quarter. So this will be three quarters here. And so if you multiply, you know, everything, 2,300 a year times, um, 2,300 a year times four thirds, Am I doing the right calculation here? I'm telling you so it's so easy to compute in your head. And meanwhile, I'm <laughs> oh, I forgot to change this to four six. So the interest rate is four six. Okay, so you multiply four. So if you multiply, so this to the other side is four thousand six hundred times four thirds. Okay, and that's you know six thousand about. Okay, so the the annual payment is going to go up to six thousand instead of 4,600. It was 4,600. The interest rate went up because there was inflation. So of course, they're going to ask you for more money every year. Because if you pay the same amount every year, and this is the, the real payment, OK, if you make the same amount, and this is time, in terms of inflation corrected dollars, you're paying less and less every year. So clearly, if you started with no inflation and a number like this, no inflation, okay, so no inflation, and now you've got inflation but the same real interest rate and the present value of your expenditures, 
the real present value, right? The, the mortgage company is going to want, the lender is going to want to get the same amount back in real terms as it got before because the inflation hasn't changed the real world. So Irving Fisher would say the inflation is just a veil. Everybody's going to want the same real interest rate and so the mortgage is going to have to return the same real thing it did before. The present value in real terms of the real payments is still going to be 100000 So if the real payments go down over time and have the same present value they had before, it's got to be that they're higher at the beginning and in real terms lower at the end. So sure enough, 6000 is a much higher number at the beginning than 4600 So of course, when inflation went up and everybody knows it's up, the mortgage companies are going to ask for higher annual payments, so it'll be 6000 a year instead of 4600 a year. But now if you inflation correct that, the 6000 every year is going to be a less, you know, in terms of real goods, less and less every year. But the present discounted value of this thing has to be the same as where you started. So the effect is the young, the young borrowers are going to be spending a lot more in real goods when they're young and a lot less when they're old. So inflation has an unfortunate impact on mortgages quoted in nominal dollars that it makes the repayments happen earlier. So the young who have less money are having to pay a huge amount. And when they get old, you know, the inflation's so high that that same $6,000 is practically nothing. So when they're 50 and 60, they're paying practically their peanuts to them. But when they were young, it was really a hardship. So there's a big problem with nominal mortgages, which is that in inflationary times, it kills the housing market. Fortunately, we're not in inflationary times. OK, any questions about that? All right, so that's the basic lesson of taking the present value. And again, you've always got to sort out the nominal from the real and look through the veil and don't get all mixed up by the fact that there's inflation. It's the real thing that you want to concentrate on as much as you can. All right, so, now, all right, so that's it for the obvious lesson of present value. Now I want to introduce another word which is very famous in finance. It's called the yield or yield to maturity. And I'm going to do it, unlike the way I've presented in the notes, I'm going to do it in terms of a hedge fund. Okay, so if you can see this, okay, so yield, the next topic, or yield to maturity, is a way of trying to compute one number that summarizes how good a bond is or how good, how well a hedge fund is done. So I think the, the more interesting case and the less obvious one is to start with a hedge fund. Okay, so now, how, how do you measure how well a hedge fund's doing or how well it's done in the past? Never mind, yeah, how well it's done in the past. We're gonna spend a lot of the course talking about this in various ways, but the first way to do it, it, it involves yield to maturity. So let's see why the problem is a little complicated. So I imagine that there are three investors in this hedge fund. Okay, so every year, some of the investors are gonna decide what to do and they're going to decide whether to withdraw money. Here's investor one. Maybe he's going to withdraw money. The hedge fund's just beginning. He's going to put in $100. The other two guys haven't done anything. Okay, so now the hedge fund, before this guy put in his money, had nothing. It's just beginning. He's put in his $100. So the hedge fund's got $100. Okay, so that's it. So I'm imagining you know, these all happen they usually happen quarterly or annually or something. They don't happen every day. There's a fixed moment at which everyone deposits their money. So let's say they happen annually. The guy puts in $100 at the beginning of the year. For the rest of the year, nobody can do anything. They can't take money out. They can't put money in. So the hedge fund, let's say, um, manages to get, put the $100 to work and finds a 7% return. Okay, so it's now got, the hedge fund altogether has got $107. So let's just go to the hedge fund altogether. Uh, has 100, had 100, the hedge fund had 100 after these guys, because only one guy put in money, and now the hedge fund's got $107. Well, that $107 is all the first guy's money, because nobody else has put anything in. He still owns it. Okay, so so far the hedge fund got a 7% return. Well, now the next year, okay, we're now at the beginning of year two. You know, our first investor thinks to himself, well, you know, they did fine, 7%, not great, but, you know, um, I'm okay, I'm not going to do anything, won't take any money out or put any in. A rich second investor puts in 1,000. 
A and another guy puts in 200. Okay, so now what's happened to the, um, to the NAV of the fund? Well, the first guy, he's, you know, at the moment they put in the money, the first guy still has 107, and his, you know, first guy still owns 107 of the dollars. The second guy's now got 1,000 in the fund, and the third guy's got 200 in the fund. And the, uh, the hedge fund now has uh, 1,200 plus the 107. That's 1,307. That's how much money is in the fund. Okay, so that's at the beginning of year two. If you're still following this, if you're not following it, interrupt me. Sorry. I mean, so what happens in year three, in, in the beginning of the next year, year three, well, let's say our guy, oh, oh so the fund, the, the hedge fund makes money. And this time it made 3%, a crappier, sorry, a less good return, only 3%, cut us off on film. I'm glad that's going to live for posterity. Anyway, 3%, 3% return. Okay, and so the, the hedge fund, which started at uh, 1307, ended the year at 1307. Now, by the end of this next year, it's made 3% on that, so that's, a, you know, it's up to 1346. Okay, so, um, you know, $39, 3% on 1300, so 1346. Now, of that, who's got the money? Well, our original guy, okay, he... He's now made, you know, everyone made 3%. So his 107 turned into 110. The second guy's got 1030 in the fund. And the third guy's got 206 in the fund. Okay, and the total fund is, you know, 1346. Now let's suppose that our guy, this is the beginning of year three, our first guy says 3%. That's a terrible return. I'm taking my money out. I've had it. It's $110. You know, that's what I have. I'm taking it out. Okay, so, and no one else does anything. So at the end of the year, you know, now he's down to zero and everybody else is where they were. Okay, and the hedge fund thing has gone down a little bit. Well, now next year, the thing does even worse. It makes a 0% return. Okay, so everybody's money is just the same, except that the second guy decides, you know, this is really getting lousy, uh, and he takes half his money out. So this is taking half his money out. What was his money? He was, you know, 11, 12, and half of that is 556, so he takes half of it out, leaving half behind, and that reduces, you know, in a column on the right, reduces what the hedge fund's total cash is. But now the hedge fund has a great year, and it makes 50%. Okay, and having made 50%, um, uh, anyway, so then. Oh, sorry. So this guy takes half his money out. At the beginning of the year, the fund does badly. Then the fund, uh, I skipped the 8%. There was an 8% return. Sorry. So, oh, what an idiot. Anyway, so the, uh, the, the, the next year, the fund returned not 0%, returned 8%. Okay, so the first guy, after the 3% return, this guy took his money out. The other guys left it in. And then the fund had an 8% return. Okay, so they're, they're, you know, that's a little bit better. But this guy decides to take half his money out, okay? And then, then the fund has a 0% return. And, and after that, this guy decides to take his money out, half his money out. But then finally, the last year, the fund gives a 50% return, which is fantastic. So all these guys, you know, everybody does well. And now let's say they all decide to take their money out. So now there's nothing left in the fund. The funds, and you know, they, they withdrew the total 934. Okay, so what I've done here, just to summarize it, is every year people are putting in money or taking out of money at the beginning of the year. You can never take out more than you have or you can put money in. The fund earns returns over the whole year and then people again decide to take money out or put money in and then the fund earns a different return the next year and eventually the fund, you know, returns all the money or people withdraw all the money. So the question is, how is the fund do, done? How would you summarize in one number how the fund has done over its one, two, three, four, five years of earning returns? That's the question. Okay? So this is a standard, you know, this happens, you know, every day, I mean, this is obviously what happens every day with hedge funds. So how do you, how, how do hedge funds report how they've done historically? So do you have any suggestions? What would you do to summarize how the hedge fund has done? If you had to pick one number, what would it be? How good an investor is the fund? Yeah. Multiply the returns to the geometric average. 
Okay, so one thing you could do is you could say, let's say what, you could, he said, literally take, multiply all these returns. What does that mean? That means if you put a dollar in the fund at the beginning, you'd earn 7%. If you left it there and never took it out, you'd get another 3%. Then you'd get 8% on top of that, then 0%, then 50%. Of course, this is a multiplicative thing. So he says, you'd get 1.07 times 1.03 times 1.08 times 1 times 1.5. Multiplying all that would, say, would give you the number of dollars you'd have at the end of five years, given that you put a dollar in in the beginning and never took it out. And if you wanted to annualize that, he said, take the geometric average, the fifth root of that, and that's the constant rate of return that would have given you the same amount of money at the end that you would get by having left a dollar from the beginning in the fund all the way to the end. That clear to everybody? That seems like a logical thing to do. Okay, that's what money hedge funds do do, in fact. That's the number they, they tell you. Now, why might not that be a great number? Did, did everyone follow what his suggestion was? So, by the way, his number is going to come out to be, well, I don't know. Anyway, it's going to be some number. We could do that. Um, in fact, it wouldn't be that hard to do. Let's just do it. Um, some... Oh, this wasn't a very, ah! <laughs> How about equals? Uh... Oh dear, all right. <laughs> Circular reference, okay. Equals sum. Oh, why do I have a zero? Why did I get zero here? Oh, because I'm trying to multiply these. I, I'm adding instead. Okay, so equals, I'll just have to do it one by one. That um, times the next one times the next one, there's obviously a much faster way of doing this, times the next one, <laughs> times that one, enter, okay, so that's what a dollar would have gotten you if you put it in and kept it to the end, and now he's saying take this to the fifth power, so I'll take uh, up um, this point two, enter, okay, so 12.2 percent. All right, now why isn't that the right number, why might you th think there should be another number? What's another number? What's the matter with that? Way back there. It's grossly inflated by the last year's 50% return. Well, is it grossly inflated? But why is it grossly inflated by that? There are going to be lots of years where it doesn't do that well. That's true, but you've taken that into account. So the years where you didn't do that well, like the 0% return, that, got, that brought the average down. So why is that uh, a problem exactly? Yeah, it's, it's averaging the good years with the bad years. So, um, yeah. Well, as far as a measure of past performance, it doesn't take into account that after three mediocre years, a lot of the money was removed from the fund. Okay, that's the crucial thing. So uh, I didn't do extreme enough numbers, but let's, let's uh, the crucial thing to take into account is that um, suppose you have a fund that starts off, many funds like my fund started off with very little money but we did it at the right time because we, we, you know, we knew that was a good time. You're going to see when the leverage cycle we talk about it was at the bottom of the leverage cycle just like this past year. You know, we're up 30% this year. So at the bottom of the leverage cycle, you're going to have a great year. Of course, we hardly had any money because the fund was uh, just starting. And so we made 50% the first year. Okay, But then everybody said, oh, these guys must be geniuses. And they poured a huge amount of money into our fund. And let's say the next year we did 10%. Uh, Actually, we had another great year the second year. But let's say that we did 10% the second year. So the 
young man in the front is saying, you know, you made 50% on pennies and then you made 10% on a gigantic amount of money. It isn't right to take, you know, the average of 50% and 10% because almost all the money that you managed, you made 10% on, not 50% on. That's his point. Okay? So how would you deal with his point? How could you figure out a way of computing the right return to compensate for the fact that some years you have a lot more money at stake than you have other years? Yes? Take a weighted average. Well, how would you take the weighted average? Sounds a little complicated. That's what I'm going to do, but it's not immediately obvious how to do it. So anybody, so I wouldn't have expected you to be able to answer that. That's a, you're right on the right track. So anyone have anything else to say? Yep. Okay, um, all right, so I'm, going, so I'm going to now give you the answer, which is a little bit like that. She's saying do some dollar weighted thing, and so you, know, you, you uh, somehow weight the numbers by how much money there was invested for that year. So because there was a lot more money invested in year you know, three than there was in year one, that number should somehow have a bigger weight. And, uh, you know, it's not exactly clear how the weights are going to get in there, but it's obvious that that's something like that you ought to do. So here's the mathematical solution that um, the internal rate of return, or yield, uh, gives. So it says, let's look every year, let's look at what happened in the fund. So, you know, for, for you know, if you, we shouldn't care about which investor put in which dollar. We care about how the fund managed dollars. The names of the investors don't make any difference. It's how did the fund manage its money. So in the first year, the fund got $100. So as for producing money, it produced a, a negative 100. You know, money went into the fund. That was the one guy invested. We don't care who it was. The total that went into the fund was 100. The second year, 1,200 went into the fund. Those are the second two guys. The third year, 110 came out. That was the first guy. The, the fourth year, 556 came out. That was the second guy. The third, the, 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 this is the beginning of the fifth year. The third guy took out $155. And then the last year, the second and third guys took out everything that was left. So from the point of view of money creation and use, this is every year what went into the fund and what came out of the fund, the net inflow out. Okay, so there are a bunch of numbers. Now, the question is, so the, the, the one number summary is, what rate of return, it's called the internal rate of return, which if you discounted all these numbers, what would Fisher say if you discounted all these numbers? Fisher, if, you had a, if you had to use just one interest rate, Fisher would say, these what's the present value of these cash flows? Well, if the interest rate was zero, you just add up all the numbers, and you're going to get a big positive. If the interest rate is infinity, then that means that the, the, you know, after the first year, you're discounting everything to zero, and you're going to get negative 100. So you could say, what? interest rate could you discount all the cash flows at to produce zero? That would be like saying at that interest rate all the fund has done is rearranged its money. It's taken money in and put money out but at that same constant interest rate the present value is zero. So it's basically it's allowed you to trade money across periods at this internal rate of return, the interest rate which makes the present value zero. So if you guessed if you guessed, uh, so 10% turns out to be the right number. So if you discounted things by 10%, you would take, you see what the formula is, you take the inflow and you discount it by 1.10 to the first power, and this you discount by 1.10 .10 to the second power, and this by, you know, the inflow, the net outflow, I guess, which is 110, you discount by the third, you know, 1.10 to the third power, et cetera. You keep discounting by that. Okay, and you get all the discounted net flows, you add them all up, and you get practically nothing. Uh, that's adding them up, and this is taking the square, and I use solver to figure out what the right discount weight, weight was to make all this zero. So that's the, that's the simple way of averaging, you know, dollar weighting everything. You, 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 you don't care about who the people are, you don't care about 
uh, whether one guy's putting money in and another guy's taking it out at the same time. You just care about the net. And if you've got a bunch of net numbers, that's the net outflow, and you're trying to say, what's the, one, what's the single rate of return? The idea is to say, at what interest rate, if, you, if there were a bank paying an interest rate, and all those things discounted gave you zero, that would be like saying the fund is functioning just like a bank. No matter when people put the money in or take it out, they're always getting this rate of return, which is 10%. Okay, so they're getting a constant 10% rate of return no matter when the money goes in or out, and that's kind of gives you a measure of how well the fund's doing. Okay, so that's the internal rate of return. It says, or the yield to maturity, it says take the net cash flows every year, find the, num find the number which when you discount at that number, you get present value equal to zero. Okay, so it's 10%, which is a different number from 12%. Now, before we got the geometric average of 12%. Now, very typically, this is the case, that this internal rate of return is lower than the you know, dollar return from putting the money in at the beginning, assuming the fund doesn't just collapse and go to zero at the end. So why is that? For funds that have survived, typically that number, 12%, is higher than 10%. Why would that be? What does that tell you about the world? Oh, someone who hasn't, uh, well, go ahead. It tells you that, and why, and how is it that the hedge fund, okay, it could tell you that. It tells you that the hedge funds are doing better when they have a smaller amount of money than when they have a larger amount of money, exactly. You've concluded that it's easier to make money when you have a small amount. What's another possible explanation? Yep. People are going to invest a lot after a big year. Right, I think that's the reason. The reason is that people pour money into hedge funds just after they've done incredibly well and they keep pouring money in then eventually there's a blow up and so when the blow up comes the hedge funds have zillions of dollars and they're lo you know they're losing a lot of money losing a lot of money and then you know then everybody pulls their money out and that's when the cycle is going up and all of a sudden the hedge funds have these huge returns again but they hardly have any money so okay any other questions about this all right, so internal rate of return is the way to, uh, is a way, we're going to see that has many shortcomings, but it's a way at getting at the idea, as several of you have said, that you can't just take the geometric average, which is what every hedge fund like ours always produces. That's the number we tell everybody because it's a better number than the other one. So the internal rate of, the, the, the geometric average of the returns are if you're an investor who puts a dollar in at the beginning and leaves it there forever, you know, what's your, ge your geometric uh, average of all your returns? That's not a good reflection of how the hedge fund's done necessarily because some years the fund had a lot of money to work with. And so the average dollar didn't do that well. And now there's a question about how should you measure the average dollar. And I've given the internal rate of return. There are actually other formulas you could give. This one isn't, uh, it, this is the most famous one. Okay, so, um, all right. Now let's see how this internal rate of return is used all the time on Wall Street. By the way, if you're not following what I'm saying, you should uh, please interrupt me. Okay, so what if you took a, a bond, a simple coupon bond? Okay, well a simple coupon bond, what is a simple coupon bond? The yield to maturity of a simple coupon bond, I'm now on this lecture called yield, what is the su a simple coupon bond? A simple coupon bond pays the same coupon every year and then pays the principal in the coupon at its maturity. So the yield to maturity is going to be the price, which is like a negative payment, okay, such that if you, so if you knew the price, suppose you, sorry, suppose you knew the price of this bond, okay, if you knew the price of the bond, okay, and so the bond is promising all these payments, how good a deal is that? Well, how good a deal it is, they would say, is you simply take this first negative payment and all these positive payments and find the unique interest rate, which when you discount it, will give you present value of zero. And so if this is a coupon bond, say paying 7%, you know, say the face is 100, it pays $7 forever and 107 at the end, and the price is 105, what do you think the yield to maturity is going to be? Is it going to be 
Or can you say anything qualitative about it? Suppose it's a 7% coupon bond, face of 100, 10-year bond. No one thinks that it'll default, but its price is 105. What is the yield to maturity in that case? Do you suppose? Just a vague guess. I, I just want a qualitative number. 6.7, OK. That's qualitatively wrong. Well, it's not qualitatively wrong. No, it's qualitatively right. It's just not, OK, it could have been better. But OK, so he's right. So what if, so what if, the, what if the price were 100? What would the yield to maturity be? 7%. That's obvious, right? So if the price of the bond, if it's a 7% coupon bond on principle on face of 100, and its price is 100, price equal to the face, then obviously the, the thing that discounts you back to 100 is going to be 7% interest. So if the price were 100, the yield to maturity would just be 7%. But I told you the price was 105, which is a lot more expensive. So it's a bad deal. So it's not going to be as good as 107. So it's not going to be 7%. And he said 6.7. OK, so I think it would be a little worse than that. But that's qualitatively just what I asked for, something worse than 7%. OK, so who said 6.7%? You did. OK, so. <coughs> Yep. That's okay, so that's another number. Okay, that's called okay. So okay, so let's let's okay, so does it so, okay, so I'm gonna come back to your question. It's a good question. So do you see that the price do you, do you all see that if you measured the yield to maturity on this bond? Okay, the yield to which so the bond, remember, pays 777, 107. Okay, and its price is 105. Okay, so the yield to maturity is going to be that number such that 105 equals 7 over 1 plus the yield plus 7 over 1 plus the yield squared plus 7 over 1 plus the yield cubed plus 107 over 1 plus yield to the 10th. OK, that's 105. So what we observed is that y has to be less than 7%. Because if y were exactly equal to 7%, this would give us 100. But this bond is more expensive. So you're paying more to get the same payments you would than the face, you're paying more than the face to get the same payment. If the price were equal to the face, it would be a 7% yield. So since you're paying more, you're getting a worse deal. So it's pretty obvious that if you want to discount this number to more than 100, namely 105, y is going to have to be less than 7%. Okay, so that's the first thing we said. Now what did he do? He gave a number and he said 7 over um, 7 over 105, which he said was about 6.7%. OK, so that number that he gave is called the current, is called the uh, current yield. Another number people gave, give. OK, and he figured that was 6.7%. So let's believe him, that's 6.7%. OK. Now, so and the and the and the okay. How does that number compare to the yield to maturity? To y. Well, we could compute this out on Excel since I'm doing so brilliantly at it now. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, so we could go, you know, seven, 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 and a hundred seven. Okay, those are our payments, and then we could try some yield to maturity, internal rate of return. Oops, internal rate of return, and let's call it. Let's guess one point oh six seven. Okay, 
and now we'd say that the, the present, the cash flows is going to be this, is going to be the left. Uh, oh dear, I have to number things. So again, there's probably some clever way of doing this. So this will be, I forgot the, to write the year. Okay, control X. Okay, so this is, let's just go, control, let's just add this. Uh, equals up plus one, enter. Okay, so I'm just going to copy this. All right, so now I've numbered all the years. Oh. <laughs> 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 equals up plus one, enter. And now control, copy. Okay, so I've numbered all the years here, and here are the payments, and now at this, at this uh, yield to maturity, I'm going to go equal the thing on the left divided by the um, yield to maturity that we're guessing um, height uh, raised to this power. Okay, and now I can just copy that, and I've got all these cash flows. What did I do that time? What? <laughs> Control copy, sorry. <laughs> Control copy, right? So I just want to copy this. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, right, right, right. Okay. So I have to, here I've got the, int the, uh, you're right. So I've got a okay. So there's a trick here, which I forgot, which is that a, the the discount rate, the internal rate of return E, I've got to put a dollar sign, dollar E dollar one, so that way it remembers the spot. Okay. So now when I copy it, it's going to remember that. Okay. What's B one? Oh, B1. Thank you. So there are two mistakes. B1. Okay, so now, control copy. So I'm supposed to be showing you how easy it is to do this, but uh, all right. So anyway, that's it. So you see for each number here, I've got the payments for every year, and I've discounted them by taking this internal rate of return. Okay, and now I just have to sum all this. Equals sum, um, parenthesis, oh shit. <laughs> I'm trying to sum it, you're right. So C, okay, so here equals, I want to sum all these. So what did I do wrong? C1 colon C10. That's what I thought I did, but obviously I didn't. Okay, good. And now we can do this and square it. Okay, so that's the thing I want to minimize. And so now I'm going to tools solver min min. C12 by concentrating on this number. Okay, and solve. All right, what did I do? Here's the sum, here's the square. Oh, the original price, aha, uh -huh. thank you very much. Okay, so we need the original price with 105. Very good, so I see that preparing this would have helped. Okay, so here's the sum. So we just summed all these things. Okay, and here we're gonna, um, uh, all right, let's just, okay, so we're summing those, right? So I summed all these, and then I've got the original price, Hundred a hundred five, enter. Okay, now we'll add equals this. Um, 
plus this. Okay. Okay, you're right. E okay, this minus that. Okay, and now we want to square this equals up squared, enter, and now we'll do solver. Hopefully there isn't another mistake. Okay, so tools solver. Um, okay, so I want that times E1. Oh, that's very bad. Okay, anyway, you can solve it using solver. <laughs> and it's extremely simple to do. And a child could learn how to do it. Okay, so we get solver and we solve all this. Um, and you should be able to use Excel with no problem at all. So, um, okay, so the question is, what are the relationships between the current yield and the yield to maturity? And suppose there's some actual interest rate so there's an actual uh, market interest rate, market interest rate of say, you know, 6% or something. Okay, so those are the things that we want to sort out now in the next five minutes. So let me go back to the notes and we'll re-ask all the questions here. I see that solver, I've broken. Okay, all right, so, okay, so let's, um, suppose that there were an actual interest rate in the economy, then our bond, the bond that was 7, 7, 7, 107, if the actual interest rate was, say, 6%, okay, the price of the bond would be more than 100. So some price, which will be the present value, will be greater than 100, obviously, because it's paying, if, it were, it, uh, if, the, price is only, if the interest rate's only 6%, this is giving you more than 100. Now the current yield is uh, 7 over the present value. It's exactly what, analogous to what he said. Okay, so if, you, if someone calls you on the phone, you haven't gotten these calls yet, but when you get older, you'll get, unless you, you know, they're, they're screened now, so it's harder to get these, but it used to be a few years ago, you'd get called on the phone quite often, and somebody would say, he's running a bond fund, and the bond fund is really doing great, and he wants to tell you that the bonds they have in the fund last year paid a current yield of seven over the present value, which is much bigger than the interest rate of 6%, and therefore you should buy his bonds. Okay, now, what can you say about that? Suppose somebody tells you there's a market price for the bonds, okay, which we know is the present value at the interest rate of 6%, and he tells you that, look, look at the market value I got last year, for these, the yield I got, the current yield I got on these bonds. The present value was, you know, some number bigger than 100, but I take 7 over, uh, over the present value, and I get something bigger than 6%. At your bank, you're only getting 6%. So therefore, it, you know, you should invest in my fund. So why is that, I mean, is that a good argument to invest in his fund? Why not? Okay, now, this bond is called a premium bond because the price is bigger than the face. And a discount bond means the price is less than the face. And a par bond, the price equals the face. So, just because a bond 
pays a coupon of 7, it may be when the bond was issued, everybody thought the interest rate was going to be 7% forever. So that's why they picked the coupon of 7, and that's, and the, so that the price, when they first issued it, would be equal to its face value. But you know, maybe the next day, so it's still a 10-year bond, practically no time has changed, but unexpectedly the interest rates fell to 6%. If you take the same coupon bond paying 7 all the time at 6% interest, <laughs> it's now, it's, its price is obviously going to go up in the market because everybody is going to discount the 7s, not at 7%, but at 6% and get a number that's bigger than 100. Okay, so you're going to have to pay more for the bond because the, you know, the present value is higher. However, people who now will try and market the bond, they're going to tell you, well, look at the market price, whatever the market price is. So this is the current yield is the market price. Okay, they'll say, look at the market price. This is what we bought the bonds for. You know, I'm a fund. I went out and bought these bonds for present value, you know, and I now look at the price I paid and I got $7 for these bonds, you know, this year in income. And seven over the market price of the bond is bigger than 6%. So I was doing a great job. You should invest in my fund. Okay, so that can't be a correct thing to say or a persuasive thing to say because the market price reflected the fact that the interest rates were 6%. Everybody was properly computing the present value and let's say the market price was equal to the present value. The present value would indeed be greater than 100 and in fact the market price would be the, the, the current yield would be more than the interest rate of 6%. So why is that? So I claim 7, uh, so theorem, if, uh, if market price, price equals present value at uh, at uh, going interest rate, then the current yield on a premium bond is always greater, greater than the interest, than the interest rate. Okay, so why is that? So in this case, if I hadn't screwed up the XL, we would have calculated the present value. Okay, so 777, 107, there's only a 6% interest. So everybody taught by Irving Fisher computes the new present value, which of course is bigger than 100. And that's the market price. Some unscrupulous salesman uh, starts a fund buys the bond for whatever this present value, the market price is, then goes out to a bunch of clients, potential clients, investors, and says, look, my very first year in business, I spent, you know, a little more than $100, and I got $7 as a coupon, and 7 over this, you know, little more than 100 is giving me, obviously, a current, is giving me a current yield that's more than 6%. I beat the interest rate. You should invest in me, and by the way, I'll charge you a little fee to do that because I'm doing so great. Now, that's always going to be the case, so it has to be that he really hasn't accomplished anything at all. So why is it easy to see that whenever I computed the present value, it was going to have to be more than, this current yield would always be more than 6%. How do I know that? Yep? Exactly. So, let's say, to keep this simpler, let's suppose these were tens everywhere. Okay, and the interest rate went down to 5%. Okay, now, what's going to be the present value of this bond? It's not going to be 200, right? If, if, if the bond paid 10, 10, uh, 210, 
Okay, suppose I have something paying 10, 10, 10, and 110, and the coupon is 5%. What is the, pre the present value of this, I claim? Present value is going to be less than 200. The, the coupon is always double the interest rate. Okay, so it looks like, you know, that's what you'd get if you had $200, but at the end, as he's saying, you're only going to get 110 and not 210. So this present value of this thing has to be less than 200. Okay, so if you double the coupon, if you, if you have the interest rate, the interest rate was originally 10% here, if you cut the interest rate in half to 5%, it looks like your annual coupon is double the interest rate. But at the end, you don't get a principal that's double the original principal. All you did was double, you know, relative to the interest rate of 5%, the coupon's twice as big as you'd normally expect, but the face isn't. So therefore, this has to be le worth less than 200. If it were, uh, you know, 200 at 5% would give you 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 210. Okay, but this gives you 10, 10, 10, 110. So obviously, the present value is less than, uh, than, less than 200. But therefore, 10 over something less than 200 is going to be more than 5%. Okay, so that's his intuitive proof, which is the essence of the thing, that if ever you have a coupon bond who's, that's a premium bond, then the current yield is always above the, uh, the current yield is always above the interest rate. So you can always advertise it as having a spectacular um, current yield when in fact it's just priced perfectly fairly. Okay, so I'm going to just continue the story of what's the right way to measure things and how you can get confused by measuring the wrong way next class.